If you want to learn to paint in watercolour and are wondering what materials you'll need, I have made this video and separated it into essentials and some nice to haves with a few little wildcards thrown at the end. Or maybe you're already proficient in watercolour and just want to have a little nosy at what I've been using. Either way, you're welcome here. So let's get straight into it. The first thing I want to talk about is using a quality surface, so your paper. And for watercolour, watercolour paper is essential. It is, it is made to handle water. I would go for something between 200 and 300 GSM. And as for paper comp composition, I would try to get something with a high cotton content paper. Ideally 100% cotton, but th this can be expensive. So you can get some alternatives that are 40% cotton, 60% cotton, that is going to, you know, work better, or I've found it works better than going for just sort of the pulp cheap student papers. I buy large sheets and I cut them down to the size I want, or I make them into my own sketchbooks. And to be honest, mostly I make them into my own sketchbooks because it's much cheaper than buying a ready-made watercolour sketchbook, especially if you want a 100% cotton one. One of the biggest benefits of buying these large sheets is that you can buy quite a few different sheets from different brands, different manufacturers, and you'll find what you like. You see a lot of videos recommending different things, Saunders Waterford, Arche, if it's called Arche, Arches, some people call it, I don't know. That one, the nice French one, Fabriano, you know, it's, you're going to get mixed reviews. People like different things, hot press, cold press, rough. You know, you don't know what you like until you try it. So buy maybe five, six sheets, try them out. You may find you love hot press paper over cold press if you, if you want more detail in it. I personally use a mixture of hot press and cold press. I have some rough paper. i very rarely find myself reaching to it. Now, 100% cotton paper can be expensive. If we look at, say, a sheet of Arche, let, let's just let's just settle this now. Let's look at how you pronounce. Desart. Desart. No, you're lying to me. <laughs> I know. Here we go. Right, got it. Got it. Arches. Arches. So the last time I bought it, the Arche Aquarelle was £6.50 for one sheet, which, uh, you know, that that's expensive. Um, same for the cold press, they're both same, same price, that's six fifty. The alternative that I like to use is the Fabriano Rosa Pina. It's actually a printmaking paper, but it is 60% cotton. And from what I can tell, it behaves very similar to the Aquarelle, the Aquarelle paper, and it's much cheaper. You can see here, I bought five sheets of it, and they were £2.10 each compared to the £6.50 for the Arche watercolour paper. So I got five sheets for £10.50. You know, that's a lot more. I like to use the Fabriano Rosapina paper as sort of my practice paper or just in just in sketchbooks, just because it's, it's cheap and cheerful. It performs well and I don't feel, you know, precious about using it. I mean, to be honest, it's kind of the same with the Arche. Like, it, paper is paper. It's there to be used just just use it. Don't feel pressures about it. Just because it doesn't matter, it's paper, it's there for practice, it's there for fun, it's there to bring enjoyment into your life. Just use it. Looking at this, I would say the Rosapina is most similar to the hot pressed paper rather than the, the cold pressed. This sketchbook I made is the Arche hot pressed. Um, that's just something I can mess around in. I think that was one sheet, so that that whole sketchbook has just cost me six pound fifty. This one is the Fabriano Rosa Peanut, yeah, the six percent cotton one. So it's just a much cheaper way of getting sketchbooks. Now, if you weren't keen on making your own sketchbooks, I would just recommend still buying the big sheets of paper, cutting them down to size, or a sketchbook I like that's not too expensive uh, for watercolour are the Stillman and Burn ones. Um, this is a new one that I haven't used yet. I don't actually, this, no, I haven't used this one yet, it's the other one. Yeah, so I have a couple of these, um, which I like. I, I like them for what colour, they're brilliant. They, like I said, they're not too expensive. There's lots of pages. It handles light washes well. I, I wouldn't absolutely saturate it because I think it will buckle. Yeah, so that's where I would begin with your paper. The next thing you're going to need is some kind of board to stick your watercolour sheet to if you're not using a sketchbook. So I just use, I mean, I've got to be honest, a lot of the time I just stick it to the desk. Um, not this, this is this is paper. My desk is uh, slightly less, slightly less attractive. But yeah, I just stick it straight to the desk and this tips up. 
just something like this could be really easily used to you know tape your paper down to honestly that's that's all you really need any surface just a nice flat surface that you can stick your tape and paper to and moving straight on from that you're going to need some tape so you can either use painter's tape i quite like this one i find this peels off really easy and it never peels off any of the paper with it so that's a plus um i think this was just called painter's tape i'll see if i can link it down below but yeah i like that one it's lasted me a long time this is my second roll um but it this has lasted me okay no so it probably took me four years to use one roll so that yeah this is my second second roll and you can just use cheap old washi tape um the only thing about using cheap washi tape is I find it can, sometimes the water, if it's not good washi tape, um, the water can bleed a little bit, uh, like through, like you get like a little deckled edge on, I mean that's quite, it's, it kind of looks like a nice effect, but if you want a really clean edge, I think the actual painter's tape is better for that. Um, and also, as you can see what I'm doing here, it's it can be really awkward on some of these tapes to actually peel it off. Um, and that can be a bit frustrating if you just want to get taped down and you want to get you're raring to go and you've got to fanny around with a washi tape. But yeah, so tape, easy peasy. Next. So let's talk pencils. So if you're the kind of person who just goes, sh oops. Oh, well, there's a piece of paper. If you're the kind of person who goes straight down with uh, with paint and don't do any kind of sketch or outline then don't worry about it but if you do a lot of people recommend using graphite for drawing your your sketch out and I'm not as keen on this to be honest like graphite is so dark and even if you do it really really lightly oh that's not even coming out even if you do it really lightly I often find it quite irritating when I can still see the graphite under the paper. So I prefer to use the Prismacolor Color Raise Pencil because they are erasable, so they're good for sketching and they don't show up as much under watercolor. I'll show you. I just keep my Color Raise pencils in a little roll up. I've got a couple missing where I've been using them, but let's say, let's let's go blue, shall we? Or I guess it's more of a cyan -y color. Let's go cyan. And you can see when we put watercolour over it, it's not gonna, it just blends in better. Oh, I just dipped in my, uh, in my clean water. It's absolute sacrilege. But hey ho. Right, so we've got our, we've got our blue just over that. And then we'll stick some over this. And it's just, so much it's just it's just gone just covers it you cannot cover the graphite in the same way so yeah definitely sketch out using color raised pencils i think they're brilliant and like i say you can erase them if you want you just get rid of it and obviously if you're using a color raised pencil it is handy to just have a little extra rubber um to hand if you want to make erases if you want to make erases, if you want to erase things, it's nice to have an extra rubber. I quite like this one for small details, the Tombow Mono Zero Eraser. Um, you can buy refills for these, I, I think they're brilliant. And obviously just your bigger standard rubber as well would be fine. So what about our permanent lines? Let's just bring this bad boy back in. So we need it to be waterproof right because we are putting water on top of it so i like to use the tombow i don't even know what this is called because it's all in japanese uh calligraphy pen the tombow calligraphy, the tombow calligraphy pen which uh this paper is a bit rough I should use a better paper um which i find is really good i think i need a new one of these it's running out a little bit makes nice lines and where it's a bit of a brush pen you can get a bit of line variation with it if you want thicker or thinner i also really like the faber castell pit pens uh, this is a 0.5 i think which is why no this is f fine okay no this is a fine so this one you can get variation on that as well 
And my final one, which is a new one for me, is actually this. And this is, I think I'll link it again below. I can never remember the things. I can never remember the names of the things. Um, this is, I think it's called the Carbon. It's the same as this company. So the Platinum, that's it. Platinum Carbon Desk Pen, I think it's called. So you've got that in the end. Um, and it is a fountain pen filled with this um, carbon ink. So it is waterproof and it just, that's a nice bottle, isn't it? That's just aesthetically pleasing. You have this one as well and it's a lovely thin line. I think I definitely prefer a thin line to a thick line. Sorry about my dodgy handwriting. And the banging would be my children. So I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're enjoying themselves. At least they're not playing the guitar. That would be much more disruptive, but I'll probably jinx it now. So we can see does not smudge, does not smudge, and does not smudge. And you can really use a lot of water and it just, it stays put. So as long as you're using a pen that has waterproof ink, you'll be golden. At home, I like to use ceramic palettes as they are easier to clean and they don't stain as much if you bought them from the store. So this is the first palette I used. This is a just an old Winsor & Newton one. It's a bit chipped and just, it, it's been well loved, bless it. Um, but yeah, I used this for a long time and as you can see, it's not, you know, it's not got much staining. It's got a few like little dents and bits, but I think that's just from me manhandling it. Um, yeah, that one's done me well, despite the chip. I actually moved on to making my own ceramic palettes and you can buy loads of different varieties. Uh, but I just, I do pottery, so I chose to make my own because why am I gonna pay money for something that I can just make? So these are my three favorite like, palette related tools. I have a little mini palette for just little little paintings when I'm just messing around. I don't use this as much for color mixing. I tend to just sort of use the colors straight out of it or mix in the wells. Um, and you can see it's got that lovely little staining from the different colors in it. This one, you've got a really nice big mixing surface on. So you can load up your paint in here if you want to and mix to your heart's content. Or what I do is I used to just use these wells for mixing in. This little one down here is a brush rest because it's really important to dry your brushes flat. If you dry your, your brushes stood up like this, the water is gonna run down into the shaft of the brush and it can just ruin the glue and the, the wood or whatever's inside of it and your bristles can come loose. It just, it just shortens the life of your brushes. So where you can, try and lay your brushes flat to dry. You don't have to have a little fancy brush rest um, you can just lay them flat on a piece of paper or a towel or whatever um, but yeah lay brushes flat to dry it don't lay them standing up in a water pot because that will that will ruin them as for palettes that i actually keep my paint in i will show you the ones that i use most often there are loads of different types of palettes you can use to keep your paint in the two main ones i prefer is to have sort of one for the studio and one for travel so my main one in the studio at the moment really it's is this one this one is just full of Winsor and newton professional quality watercolors you can see i've used a lot you know can tell which colors i like the most right this palette is really nice can you hear my partner singing e-i-e-i-o Ah, oh, old MacDonald is just the bane of my life at the moment. Anyway, these are really nice because you can squeeze out your colours into the wells and they dry like that. You can close it, open it, and it's it's absolutely fine. It stays that way. Oh, they're having a bath. You can hear my children in the bath, so I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, you can see you've got a nice mixing space for it. It's just a really handy little palette to have. So yeah, this is just a nice, cheap, easy option doesn't break the bank and it's quite nice and big for when you're at home for a travel water palette there's lots of different options but anything small and compact will do you i use this one the most this is the Winsor and newton one it's got that's just the card and the colors in it uh, it's got a little water bottle in your water a tiny little brush which i'll be honest i've never once used but i keep it in there just because it's part of the set isn't it it's got a nice, generous mixing space on all of these surfaces. Sorry, mine's a bit dirty, but what are you gonna do? And then it comes 
with space for 36912. So originally it comes with 12 in there, but you can squeeze an extra two uh, pans in there if you want to. I think this actually had a little sponge in it when I got it for sort of dabbing off your brush on. So yeah, something small and compact is really handy when you go out there. Like I said, there's loads of different types. I've got this one as well. I bought this one just for the shape of it, to be honest. I, I haven't, I have never used Van Gogh paints. It's got a really nice, generous, generous mixing area. I think that's all you need for a travel palette. You don't need much bigger than that. That's plenty of colors. What's that? 14, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. No, that's actually less. So that's 12 colors. This is 14. So, I mean, that, that's just brilliant. You get so many colors in such a small amount of space. You've also got the little lid for your water as well. Let's have a look at what colors you should have in your palette. You can just go for reds, blues, and yellows, but it's really convenient to have some more earthy tones in there to get you going and make mixing a little bit easier for you. But you literally can just have red, blue, and yellow and make do from there by mixing your earthier, browny, gray tones from that as well. So let's look at yellows to begin with. Ideally, you're going to have a cool yellow and a warm yellow in your palette. So for cool yellows, and these are the more green based yellows, and they're really useful for, mi for mixing bright greens. I would go with something like a lemon yellow, or something like a Hansa yellow light, or a bismuth yellow. You can see these are all a nice cool yellow. For your warmer yellow that you can use to mix really nice oranges or mix a mossy green, like a more dull green. I would go for something like a cadmium yellow deep or a cadmium yellow pale. Um, this is a, these are both Winsor & Newton's. You've got cadmium yellow and the pale version or something like an Indian yellow you can get away with as well. So there's your yellows, your cool and your warm yellow. For the blues, we'll go with cool blue first. And really all blues are cool, um, but a more green yellow blue is a cooler blue and a warmer blue swings more towards purple or red so for the cooler blues i would go for you've got your cerulean blues this is the Dan daniel smith and the windsor and newton one or the phalo blue green shade or the windsor blue green shade and if we're thinking about using these for mixing purpley colours, these are going to make a lighter, more lilac -y purple than a warmer blue will. There's your cool blues. For your warmer blues, something like a French ultramarine is going to it's going to be lovely. It makes really nice purple colours. And if you add a red, it makes a more dull green, sort of a more natural green, more, more of an earthy green. Here I've got the Winsor & Newton version and the Daniel Smith version. You can see the Winsor & Newton one, it's a bit more granulated than the Daniel Smith version, but the Daniel Smith is still a granulating colour. And for your warm and cool reds, for the cool, I would go for something like Quinacridone Rose or Rose Madder. Um, you can get away with Alizarin Crimson, but it, it will make a little more duller greens than something like a quinacridone rose will. Now really the quinacridone rose is more of a magenta, I mean a pink isn't it? It's a, it's a pink magenta colour rather than what we most commonly associate with red colours. For the warm red I would go for something like a cadmium red or a pyrrole scarlet. This one's Winsor & Newton, this one's the Daniel Smith. You could also get uh, get by with any any sort of scarlet red or even a vermilion and these warmer reds are going to be really good for mixing nice bright oranges um, and if you're using a warm yellow it's going to make an even nicer like warm orange. Now looking at the neutrals it's really nice to just have some nice browns in your palette so you don't have to worry about mixing them all the time. You can mix them but it's much easier to get these colours and just have the pigments there um, to really add some dimension to your painting. I think having a nice mix of cool browns and warm browns as well as a nice grey is, is just really nice and convenient to have. So the ones I have picked out would be something like a yellow ochre or a quinacridone gold. This one's Windsor Newton, this one's Dan Daniel Smith. A burnt umber for a little bit of a deeper brown. More of a reddy brown like burnt sienna. This is the Daniel Smith one versus the Windsor and Newton one. Or even a quinacridone burnt orange would kind of be in this category. 
and for a much cooler, deeper brown, something like a raw umber. And finally, last but not least, would be a nice grey. And Payne's grey is just lovely. It's more of a blue grey and you can use it to replace a black. It just looks much more natural. You can also mix nice dark, darker purples and darker blues, darker greens. Um, for example, if you had, if you had say, the, say the pink, you'll get a nice dark purple. Or if you add a yellow, you're going to get a nice dark green. Uh, so that's a really handy, convenient colour to have. And I would say, starting out, that's all you need. But by all means, if you've got any colours that you really love, just, just sort them in there. I really love like turquoise teal colours. So I might add in something like a cobalt turquoise light, just because I love this colour. And I also quite like lilacs. Um, so I might add in a, a nice, bright lilac, lilac colour as well. I really like this lilac -y colour by Daniel Smith called Amethyst Genuine and you probably won't see it on camera but it has a bit of a bit of shimmer to it. I just I just think it's beautiful. I really love it. So, you know, I would I would have them. Do you know why? Just because I like them. Another colour I quite enjoy having is indigo blue. Um or actually it's just called indigo, the Windsor and Newton. It's a lovely deep blue. Um that is brilliant if you want to paint like night skies or the ocean. Just it's just a lovely colour. So start off with these as your main colour and then add colours that you like because we all like different colours. It's okay. I mean, we've got so much, so much choice of paint to choose from. Just pick what appeals to you. These colours appeal to me. So I, I always try to sneak them in to my sets where I can. But I think this is a good starting point and then add a couple of colours that you really love into it. Because you only need a small set I would really recommend you go for artist grade watercolours. You can get students grade. I did that. I bought student grade. I went for a Winsor Newton Cotman set, the 45 set. I used them for a while and then I tried the professional line of Winsor and Newton watercolours and I could not go back. I swiftly sold my 45 set of Cotman paints and just moved all the way over to the artist grade because they were so much more pigmented there's less filler they were easier to use I just I could tell the difference straight away using them and that was still when I was just a beginner so I would go straight to artist grade you're giving yourself the best chance of getting better and enjoying using the paints I also think buying tubes is better and then squeezing them out into pans because it works out cheaper and I find it easier to reactivate the paint squeezed from a tube than the actual pans when you buy them ready. Let's move on to brushes. When I started out I think less is better and I still do now really. I think keep it simple and just have a few brushes. I mean you can you can see these brushes are well have been well loved. Um, they're missing bits of the wood and I've chewed the heck out of this one. So, so yeah, start simple, a small round, a medium sized round and a large round. I also had, but I'm not sure where it's gone, a flat head. So four brushes then. This may change. If you're painting on a really big piece of paper, you might want a bigger size than this. But if you're just gonna be painting in your sketchbook or on a smaller sized bit of paper, I think this is the size you need, or that's the size I found useful. Now that I've been painting longer, I've upgraded my brushes a bit and moved on to some travel brushes. So instead of this brush, I've gone for a mop brush. And these are, I think this is squirrel hair, but it's lovely and soft and does gorgeous washes on the paper. This brush is by Rosemary and Co. These brushes are the Isabi brush, Is the Isabi brushes. It's essentially me just moving on from these two, and these ones are they're just lovely quality. Best thing about all of these, you might have noticed, is they are travel brushes. So I can use them at home, or I can use them when I'm out and about. A nice little tip I've found is when you put it in, just twist it as you go, and all of the hairs will twist their way back into the cap. It can look a bit scary, but it, it does all go in. And there you go, you've just got these nice little paint brushes that just slot straight in, it can go straight in your bag. 
So I think they're really handy. I also take this one out traveling with me. So I have a flat brush with me as well, usually at all times. Um, I haven't bought a travel one yet, but I will be getting one eventually. A mop, a flat, a bigger round and a smaller round. That's all you need. I also use this brush quite a lot. This is a dagger brush and you get really nice long straight lines with it. Another really handy brush for when you're out and about, it's nice to have, are the Pentel water brushes. Is this one Pentel? This one's also Pentel. Yeah, so really easy. Stick your water in there. You don't have to worry about bringing a pot with you for clean water. You can just have a dirty water one. Or if you don't even want to worry about carrying dirty water with you, you can just carry a wet sponge like this one. I use this for all sorts. I mean, it's rock hard now, but yeah, you just dampen that, clean water in there, dirty water in here, clean your brush off. For looking after your brushes, make sure you have a good brush cleaner. I use the Masters Brush Cleaner and Preserver. All you do, this is this is my newer pot. Um, again, it took me about three years to get through one of these pots. So they do last a long time. This is the bigger one I think they offer. All you do is gently twist your brush around in the top of here and run it under the sink. You'll be surprised at how much color comes off your brush when you use this. I thought my brushes were clean. They were not. Luckily, I learned that early on. So I've made sure to really look after my brushes by cleaning them properly after use and making sure to let them dry flat. So what about water pots? You need one for your dirty water, one for your clean. And to be honest, sometimes I even have two for dirty water. So I give it a really good swirl in the first dirty water pot. Then I do it again in the second dirty water pot, which is not as dirty. And then I go in for my clean water for actually picking and mixing my colors. You do not need a fancy water pot. If you're at home, just use whatever you've got. Literally an old mug, a random glass, whatever, whatever you want. You do not need to buy anything fancy. I am using stuff that I've made in pottery again. So don't laugh at me. Okay, don't laugh. But this is the first ever thing I made on the wheel at pottery. This class is about five years ago now. So a long time ago. First ever mug I made. You can see it's, I think it's a bit discolored where it's got, um, watercolour residue in the bottom. But yeah, I just use this because it, it's not an actual, I can't really drink out of this. It, it's gonna make the tiniest cup of tea in the world. Um, I wasn't very confident at making big mugs then. So yeah, I just use this. Um, and just to show that I've improved, this is my old mug. These are my new mugs. So this is a much, much heftier size. Um, this one's hand built though. This one's not done on the wheel. So yeah, use whatever you've got at home. For travel, keep it simple. I like to bring this one out with me. So this one is a, just a little pop out one. Faber Castell, nice and simple. Fits in your bag easily. An even smaller option for on the go is these little ones. I think they're predominantly used in oil painting for holding um, like linseed oil or whatever in or spirits, I don't know. I don't know, I don't oil paint so, but I know they're popular in oil painting. Clean water here, dirty water here. You can take it with you in your bag and seal it up. It's a good one. Easy peasy. Here you go, look, satisfying pop. Let's talk about a nice to have. Sorry, mine's a bit dirty when I use it so much. This is just a little spritz bottle. This is amazing for just spraying. Oh, it's empty. It's because I was using it yesterday. Uh, this is amazing for just spraying onto your paints to moisten them before you use them. You literally just spritz it over before using and it's so much easier to pick the paint up off of the palette. This one's not too bad because it's a tube paint that I've squeezed out, but especially if you're using the pre-made pans, I find the paint a lot harder to activate. So just a minute before you start painting, just give them all a good spritz and it's so much easier to get them off. I think this is brilliant to have. So I prefer to use a different kind of medium to get the white on my paper. Oh, I can't wait for it to dry now, aren't I? Mm. This is a gouache. It's uh, I've not cut myself. I've, it's literally red paint. Ugh. If 
my hands look a bit stained red that's just because i got red wash all over myself anyway moving swiftly on this has dried now so let's go with the posca pen to begin with it's a nice white wait you dry you're not dry <sighs> i lied also you probably shouldn't use your finger to test it <sighs> there we go oh yeah mm. it's not a great example but yeah you can still get white maybe if you're going for something more subtle similar to the posca you can get some white marks you can get it a little bit thicker than that and get some nice white marks on it and then i think the king of all these has it's just it's just got to be the gouache permanent white here which I can barely get the lid off of because i haven't used it in so long thank you children oh that's a bit it's a bit grim let's give that a mix that's just the binder coming away from it and then we'll get a nice little skinny brush and then you just go straight over it's a lot of gouache i need a lot more water with that but whatever gouache goes over the top nice and white right you get the idea white gouache is one of the essentials i think you can give a go at some of these but i don't know that i'm just bad at using them but i find them to be less reliable than just going straight with gouache moving on to paper towels or just an old tea towel paper towels are really handy i always keep them close got some up here you can use them for dabbing excess water off your paper you can wipe your brushes on them um but you can go through quite a lot of it which is why i have a couple of these just in rotation um to wipe my brushes on same use as a paper towel basically except it's reusable uh this one you can see i've obviously used with acrylic or something as well so the, it has stained a bit but who cares it's literally just for my art so not like i'm cleaning my kitchen with it so these are just things that i think are fun to play with in watercolor my first little wild card is the neo color 2 crayons i guess they would be from caran d'ache these i absolutely love using in life drawing and mixed in with watercolor as sort of a first layer so you can literally just bash them down on the page um, and then all you have to do is add water to them and they act just like a watercolor really really love it it's kind of like a watercolor pencil but you get a lot more on the page to a red as well shall we With a thicker line and a thinner line a little bit of water on there and it just absolutely melts it's just it's just gorgeous you can do really subtle washes with that same for that one just really lovely melts straight into the water just like watercolor same here it just it's just i just love them i think this they just got so many uses you can brush them out completely so you can almost not see any of the lines that i put down there or you can just do it subtly to parts of it and have some of the texture underneath you you can just do whatever you like with them i can show you an example of where i've used these you can see in here i've used them at points so this is drawing with it just dry and then here i've added water in the places that i wanted it same here do not look at that face i don't know what i was doing this is this is them again with no water added again no water added this is one with water added and then if we go back to the start, you can see examples of just where I've been splashing around with water. I mean, this, this is a five minute example. So this was all very quick. And here you get a little sneak peek at my second wild card. Let me tell you now, you need this wild card in your life. Brusho. Here's a couple of the colors I use most often. Alizarin crimson, black, turquoise, violet 
and sea green. Now, let me just show you with the black, for example, you sprinkle it down on the paper, or you can actually use it on already wet paper. And then all you have to do is take a little spritz of water and it absolutely comes to life. And you can see here, just in this black alone, there are so many colours. There's these lovely blues streaking through, this sort of darker black, this orange in there. It's just absolutely stunning. It's so vibrant and beautiful. Just, just absolutely stunning. You can get some really lovely effects in the sky or in landscapes, on the ground. Just, you can just, you, there's just so many things you could use it for. I really like it for backgrounds though. Obviously you don't have to use this much. I very rarely use that much in actual paintings. At life drawing, I literally just throw it down because I'm just there to have fun. So yeah, brush -o. give it a go. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.